any proof for them that they were beyond, oh, this is a modern author's interpretation of uh, of the source, you know. And um, for that kind of thing, if you're saying, well, that's how it seems from the language, I'd ask, did you read that in the original Persian and make that based off, make that a, assumption based off of the wording in the Persian? Because you're also then assuming that the translator, Boyle is a good translator, uh, but he also translated that in the 1960s, I want to say. Yeah. It's a bit older now. So you have to keep in mind, too, as a man of that time, he, he might have translated it a certain way, or he might, he might have made it less spicy than it actually was in the Persian text. I don't know. But. I think I encountered something similar when I first got introduced to Hamilton. And, like, there's always this speculation amongst the Hamilton fan, amongst the Hamilton fandom and the general historical community of the American Revolution, whether uh, Alexander Hamilton and his best friend John Lawrence were gay. And there is actually a very spicy letter that I've had the of reading, <laughs> where, like, Hamilton describes all sorts of things, like... I'll just say the size of his penis, I'll put it that way, as if John Lawrence a actually knew that. But also, at the same time, to me, this is partly also contradicted by uh, specifically uh, a little part of the passage in the letter where he Hamilton specifically says, get me, a hot, uh, get me a hot wife in South Carolina, and these are the qualities I want. So... <laughs> It's really hard to say. I'll probably say the first uh, Secretary of the Treasury was maybe partly bi or maybe masking his sexuality. Who knows, honestly, at this point? <laughs> Experimented in college. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Hamilton was college age at the time of the American Revolution. That fits him perfectly. <laughs> uh, Alright, so... We discussed Torgina Fatima. What's next on your list there? I believe uh, right at this one, uh, right at this part of Germany, he also briefly describes the subjugation of the Uyghurs. Basically, the Idikut, or leader of the Uyghurs, joins with basically no fuss at all, and aids the and aids the, the Mongols against Kuchlug, and they get some benefits out of it. And they mostly stay on through uh, help uh, to help against also the Khorasanids and the and the Tonguts. Mm -hmm. And the Idikut also at this time, uh, 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 at the time that he submitted to the Mongols, got a very political marriage with uh, one of Genghis's daughters, specifically Ilaltun. And Ilal Tun is unfortunately uh, uh, gets a very sorry end after the death of Ogadai when she is accused by Torajin, Ogadai's wife, of actually poisoning Ogadai. And honestly, I just think that was just a trumped up charge to probably uh, snag Ilal Tun's inheritance. Take out a rival. Yeah. Yeah, because. I don't think Ilaltun had the logistics to actually poison our good friend Okadai. <laughs> it's... I don't think... Like, the, the charge of poisoning Okadai, you know, it, it gets thrown around a couple times in the period. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't think anyone seriously doubts that he just drunk himself to death. He was terribly self-destructive with all that booze and ladies. <laughs> He actually gets worse after Tolui's death. Right. He sort of removes himself from, not from office, but like from day to day government. That kind of thing. And basically just drinks and parties and hunts. And that, that was what I think the night before he died, he, he'd been, he was like drunk and he went out hunting or something and. Like till late, and he'd been told not to, and then came back and died the next day. And I, he drunk himself to death. Big, big drunk, big drunk Argadai. Everyone knows that. <laughs> and 
Uh, and I believe, th uh, and I believe I immediately after that, Ogade's Ogade's son, Ogade's son, I believe, uh, Kaznas uh, succeeds. Wait, that just might be my notes. I'll just throw it out. So, anyway, it's like, um, it's like Ogadai gets succeeded by Guyuk and. No, wait, no, wait, Kaznaz, uh, no, wait, Kaznaz, no, wait, I think here is going on. So, Kaznaz, I believe, succeeds the Itikut? I don't know, maybe my notes are getting yeah, crazy. I don't know who succeeds uh, Bartruk. Right. Wow. And I believe here, uh, Ally Becky is thrown in as the replacement of Ilal Toon. So basically, the Uyghurs are kept in line. They're just with a uh, uh, they're just with a different faction of the Mongols. And then after that, oh yes, <clears throat> there is actually um, there is actually I believe a Uyghur plot at uh, a Uyghur plot shortly after the death of the Edeka to actually uh, throw off the Mongol yoke. And specifically, throw off Monka, obviously, because Monka uh, uh, throw off uh, throw off Monka um, after uh, Guyuk is killed. And this uh, plot is headed, I believe, during the rule of uh, Salani, who succeeds as Idikut, and the chief uh, planner here is uh, Bala Bitikchi. And several other no uh, Uyghur nobles get in, and they agree to attack uh, Monka while he's at Friday prayer. Which is kind of weird, because if I recall, uh, wasn't, like, Monka Christian? Monk, um, seems to have just been a shamanist. Oh. Uh, very good at sort of presenting himself, certainly. Sort of like Kublai would do, is so... Right. I'm, I'm interacting with Muslims, I'll show Muslim leanings. I'm interacting with Christians, I'll show Christian leanings. Uh, again, in Rubrook's uh, interview, he says, uh, relig religion's like a hand, but God sent out all of these religions as the fingers were. So oh. Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, uh, but all of them lead to the truth, which is God, right. I guess, the truth. Shamans, so... That the shamanism should be noted even today in Mongolia, it, it's not an exclusivist religion. Right. So that so Mongolia today is Buddhist, like largely Buddhist, uh, but people who do will still go to shamans. Will still do you know shamanist traditions, kind of kind of thing. That because it's not a religion where it's you're shamanist or you're not. It's the Christian and still do. Uh, still speak to a shaman kind of thing. Ah. The Mongo like the Mongols sort of view of religion for most of the period until they start converting at the end of the century is that base kind of something like all of these religions are true, all of them speak to God. It's kind of debated whether they all saw it as it's the same God or that these are all separate God. Like there's a Christian God, there's a Muslim God. Buddhist God kind of thing. Basically, any of these could be right, so you want them all on your side anyways. Yep. Uh, thing. Sounds a lot like the Roman Empire there. But anyways, a couple of the conspirators amongst the Uyghurs are caught, so the whole plan is going all the way downhill from here. And I believe one of them, um, Tegmish, actually testifies against the rest of the, against the, rest of the Uyghur nobles. And... Uh, and and eventually all every everything about the plot just comes out thanks to a lot of let's just say um, aggressive negotiations, <laughs> otherwise known as let us uh, torture you. <laughs> and apparently here, uh, I believe. Um, Somebody actually pardons them to uh, uh, pardons them. That being a uh, Sorkotani, uh, uh, Sorkotani, or at least uh, Tegmish is pardoned and later promoted because he came out, he did the honest stuff, and uh, testified. 
And that was apparently before the torture all went down, as far as I know. And then uh, there's a little bit of a... A little bit of a section of Germany where he tries to recount what he has heard from the Uyghurs is supposedly the origins of the Uyghur people. Kind of, but just from a fancy prose standpoint, it kind of reminds me of a lot of sections of Herodotus because it has this flowery, la uh, flowery language, very over exaggerated story, feels like there's a lot of magic and superstition involved. <laughs> and I believe. Uh, 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 this is uh, described as happening right along the Oregon River near Karakoram. So we're looking at a little bit of, I believe, uh, uh, somewhere in Mongolia. And initially, uh, and initially, um, they they have appointed a chief on. Uh, they, they appointed uh, very uh, chiefs to succeed one after the other up until a guy by the name of. Uh, Buku Han took over, and he is famous for uh, founding uh, the various cities of the Uyghurs, known as like Ordu Balik, uh, Mao Balik, and event uh, Ordu Balik and Mao Balik. And this eventually uh, gets turned. Uh, these uh, towns, I believe, get merged into the famous uh, Kesh Balik that is used during Mongol times. And he, and I believe that Jermaine here also mentions a little bit of. Uh, he's he's getting some difficulties in translating these uh, uh, translating these stories because he's working, I believe, with uh, uh, no wait, I think my notes just messed up. Sorry, <laughs> that happens. So wait, oh wait, I know what's going on. So like, bo so like, they're getting their translators going on because they're trying to establish their kingdom or empire, and they're running and they're conquering some people, and they're. And they're having difficulties with speaking to each other, and then uh, Kitan is brought over to kind of resolve everything. And and there here they also describe a mound uh, rising between two trees, and uh, the light and there's a very bright light that shines on the mound as, as the various uh, weaker women give birth, and the. Uh, here, Giovanni describes that the trees speak and they are worshipped as if they are gods. And here they have, and here they briefly mention that the Uyghurs during, had about five chiefs uh, uh, right up until Buku Han, and Buku Han is described as basically the best thing that happened to the Uyghurs since, like, ever. <laughs> And he comes to power with not very much backstory described by Giovanni, and uh, God apparently sends him uh, three ravens, and and everything is a little and the dates mysterious for a, for a little while. But either way, they the Uyghurs they get their land. They with the land comes the responsibility, and they start. Conquering whatever they can, and they sort and they sort of have this, uh, and they sort of had this uh, dream of this of this white shaman. Kind of makes me think of this very uh, of the very famous Lord of the Rings scene where Gandalf the White comes in, <laughs> and it and they and they and the shaman apparently comes in with a rock and. And it's basically, um, Uyghurs, uh, keep calm and keep, uh, and carry on with the conquering. <laughs> and the Uyghurs, as being one of the more civilized step tribes, they apparently are also well, well versed in magic and science, at least that's what Giovanni says. And, but he, but he also is a little crass about, uh, their, uh, idol worshipping slash Buddhism, <laughs> because, well... He's a Muslim judge, of course he's going to be a little crass about it. <laughs> and and apparently they also have a hatred of Islam, at, at, least, at least the Ketons and the Uyghurs do. And I think as far as I know, especially with the Uyghurs, uh, with the, no, the Ketons, 
that is mostly uh, backed up with, I believe, uh, how Genghis eventually got invited to just rip open the Kariki Taikanate and decimate everything in sight. Uh, some, it's a bit more with Huchlug's actions, though, because he sort of went from being in this, when he usurped power in Karakitai. Right. Uh, he had been an historian Christian, uh, converted to the Buddhism of uh, his, of the Gurkhan's wife, or Gurkhan's daughter, who, he, who he'd been wed to. And, but he converts to like a really uh, virulent version, and he decides to take this out on the local Muslims in the uh, Terra Basin. So uh, he's punishing them. At one point, he uh, uh, nails an imam to the door of his madrasa. Uh, He's taxing them that he's forcing them to dress like ketons or in Chinese style, it's not really clear. Ah, yeah. And, but basically, what ends up happening is when Zev, is, the Mongol general, is sent to uh, take down Huchlug, uh, the Mongols really stress there oh, you know, whoever joins us can worship whoever they please. Because and they do this, and that leads like the entire region to rise up against Huchlug, because Huchlug was so hated. <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, so it was essentially, they really played up the religious tolerance there, and the Mongols end up hailed as uh, liberators, kind of. Yeah. Or, kind of, they were. Right. And m most of the region, seem, that region at least seems to submit uh, wholly voluntarily. So, yeah. very little uh, bloodshed, it's, it seems. It wasn't, I don't think there was any city sacked. It was, and the few that held out, when the Mongols showed back up with Hushluk's head on a stake <laughs> and paraded it before the cities, the remainder uh, then just submitted in the region. So yeah. It was a very quick campaign, so I don't think there was any much for sieges. Right. And here, uh, they meant, and here the, as the Uyghurs are going through, uh, Buku um, dies of old age and is bad as usual, and then he gets his uh, various successors, which are unfortunately, I believe, not mentioned by Jubaini, and there. But the tree worship uh, continues because apparently that's keeping the women safe while they're giving birth, so that helps the Uyghurs uh, survive and prosper. And this decent discussion keeps on continuing. Uh, Besh Balik is officially built. And this is just in time for uh, Chinggis to defeat Togrel and force Kuchlu to flee to the Karakitai. So, a surprising uh, change of direction, Jumani, but not entirely unexpected. <laughs> And here, Jumaini mentions that uh, Sultan Muhammad goes against the uh, Karakitai as Kuchu comes in and basically ruins everything that is given to him in the Karakitai Hanate. <laughs> ranging yeah, from. Kuchuk uh, was kind of a punk. <laughs> <laughs> ranging it's from. Not, nothing he didn't touch that he didn't wreck. <laughs> yeah, he also uh, usurps the Merkits, that, or rather what's left of them. Uh, the specifically their leader Toktua, and then after he uh, defeats his uh, uh, defeats his father-in-law the Gurhan in battle, he uh, he he and Shah uh, and Shah Muhammad actually partition what's left of the Karakitai Hanate. Kind of makes you think of this sort of like a short-term gain, uh, eventually turning to very long-term loss. Because guess who's right next to you. <laughs> And just to, like, free the schedule to now, all right, let's take care of Huchluk. <laughs> but actually doing this, seizing power in Karakatai, that's probably what drew Chingus there, because now it's, well, I can't leave Huchluk, he's an old enemy, and now he's just taking control of this, uh, what the Mongols know is a powerful empire. They don't know what state it's in precisely at that moment. They don't know how weak it actually is. Right. But, so... We gotta take care of this, and it, rather unexpectedly, it collapses like a house of cards in a hurricane force wind. 
<laughs> oh yeah, so. it absolutely does. And and then the and then I believe the there is a little bit of a revolt by the Kotan and the and the Kashgar, and this is also just very quickly brutally crushed. I believe by. Either it's the Karakitai or the Nekorzimits. And uh, and then there's a little bit of the whole uh, Kuchlu decides to uh, keep on persecuting the Muslims because he's part of a very extremist sect of Buddhism and he officially converted on Nestorian Christi uh, Christianity to please his wife. And there's all sorts of devastation done to the poor Muslims in the Karakitai Hane. Mosques and schools are just <clears throat> burnt across the whole place. And <clears throat> Chinggis interferes because he was basically invited by whatever Muslims are left. And Chinggis, of course, makes some promises that he fully intended to keep. Basically, hey, just say yes to me and you can worship whatever God you please. And then Kut and Chingus just marches into Kuchuk's place and he's like, Hello, I'm killing you. We're done here. <laughs> and Kuchuk and Kuchuk is captured, beheaded. Uh, Toktua is also found and killed. And Muhammad Sultan is uh, uh, briefly pers and, and of course Muhammad Shah is uh, of course attacked uh, not too long after the Karakitai are subdued, and this weakened and and this and the weakened situation that Juvani described uh, that Juvani described here of the of the partition of the Karakitai between Kuchluk and Muhammad Sultan is basically what weakened the Karakitai to the point where they are absolutely positively no match for the Mongols. I'm sorry to interrupt uh, this, but I have other obligations, so I'm afraid I must depart. All right. Um, uh, nice meeting you, Jackmeister. Likewise. Uh, and uh, I'll see you all later. Bye. All right. Take care. Take care, Jay Burke. Love ya. So, anyways, as we are going to keep on going, the uh, so so after. So after Giovanni kind of is pretty pissed that Muhammad Sultan just basically weakened the situation for this very short term gain of a little bit of territory, they go after they do the Mongols then hear about uh, I believe uh, Ali Din Muhammad of the Khotan. And he and they're protesting the Kuchu getting tortured and martyred or something like that. And then the Karluk Turks also briefly tried to aid the Karakitai, although of course to no avail because the Mongols win. And then uh, Arslan and 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 Arslan, the leader of the Karluks, is given a job by Shamur. He gets some prestige off of that. But then Shamur is is briefly stabbed by another guy named Simba. But and after all this intrigue, the Karluks finally submit to Genghis. And I believe uh, here there also uh, some of the Karluks are also being. Uh, uh, no, wait. There is a different. And so there is a guy named Karluk himself, just one individual, not to be confused with the Karluk Turks. Is that uh? Was the individual named Karluk? Was he a Mongol? I, I, I'm not exactly sure here. My notes uh, don't. My don't. My notes don't mention it. But uh, he just is just because uh, just the Mongols had a tendency to name their children after conquered peoples. So I just was wondering that. So, oh, I didn't know there was one named that named themselves after the Karluks, but it shows up with like the Tangut and the Khorizms and or Khorizmians and. Yeah, it makes sense. They named children after uh, uh, conquered peoples. Yep. A boss. And here, uh, th they describe this specific individual, Karluk, uh, uh, named Karluk, as, I believe, the horse thief. 
because he's been stealing horses, and of course that's a little bit of a problem. But I believe he's been, but I believe he's been mainly uh, resisting. Uh, um, he's been, he was actually resisting Kuchlu shortly before Chingus arrived. Oh, that fellow. Yes, I actually do know who you're talking about. Uh, so that his name wasn't Carlo. It was he was a Carlo. He was his name was Bozar or Ozar, and he took control in Almalik. Oh yes, that's uh, what I was about to get to. Yes, and yes, and he was so he submits to Chingus actually early, like throws in his lot with Chingus, and when Kuchlug comes about, takes the city, kills or no, he captures Bozar while he's hunting, and right. kills him, and that brings Chingus. Oh, so that's like the official like excuse for war between Chingus and Kuchlug. Right. Like, you just killed my vassal. Now I'm going to come in here. <laughs> mop the floor. And then we get into... Uh, so Huchlok flees. He flees to uh, like Balasagun. Then flees to the Terran Basin. That's when Zev shows up. And they do that uh, proclamation of religious toleration. Right. There and gets every region to, to rise up. Mm -hmm. And he ends up... They pursue uh, Huchlok into Badakhshan which is, like, northeastern Afghanistan. With like That's, like, how far they're, like, chasing after him. And he ends up... I think it's, like, the Vakan Corridor. Oh, wow. Like he ends up getting cornered by, like, a group of hunters and uh, killed, and they bring him... Bring I forget if they kill him first, but they bring his head either alone or still attached to his body. <laughs> Jeff. Uh, and then that's sort of the... The ignominious end of Huchlug, <laughs> you know, thousands of kilometers away from uh, Mongolia. Indeed. And I believe so. So, of course, after uh, after uh, Bozar is uh, is slain, then I believe uh, I'm, I I get here. And I'm an, oh, it's mentioned here. Uh, Ozar the religious, and. Uh, Ozar does a little bit of loaning, and then uh, and then his son uh, Signak Tegin uh, continues the tradition of doing the loaning, and they continue in service and receive more tr uh, receive more. And I believe this is all in service to the Mongols because, well, uh, funding the Mongol Empire obviously isn't cheap. <laughs> and they also have. Uh, and there's also a little bit of a trade mission to the Mongols at this time. Uh, there's lots of goods running around. Uh, the usual, the foundations of diplomatic immunity are also being put in here by the Mongols as usual. And then, of course, the trade party is sent to the Khorzimids. This is going to go well, right? <laughs> Jack Messer. What do you mean? <laughs> I have no idea what you're alluding to. <laughs> no, this cor this uh, trade party sent to the Khorzimids uh, goes all the way to, I believe, Ochar, and there they encounter the local governor, Inalchuk, who promptly arrests and robs them. <laughs> and this... And, and, of course, and, of course, whatever remains of the trading party manages to just barely get back to Mongolia. And then uh, Chinggis sends in a second trade party, hoping for better negotiations, at least the Shah Muhammad. Of course, that's, I believe, when the famous Ochar massacre occurs. And this is used conveniently as the excuse for Chinggis to basically just march on Khorzimid, amid Persia and wreck everything in sight. He actually sends one more group of envoys after the Ochar massacre uh, to Shah Muhammad, telling him basically to give up an Altruk. Like, surrender them, you know, and then we can let this bygones be bygones. This was the action of a... One governor. Uh, governor out of sorts kind of thing. And it, uh, Shah Muhammad, he kills the Muslim with the party, and then cuts the beards off of the Mongols who are with them, or, like, cut their hair off, something like that, sends them back. And that's the declaration for war between... Ooh, yeah, he was, he was trying to avoid. He was trying to avoid having to march over there, 
He didn't want to. All he wanted was those economic ties. He just wanted to open up trade. And then that's... So Chinggis Khan's most famous campaign in the West is the one he tried to avoid and, like, talk his way out of even after they killed all of his, uh... All of his uh, diplomats. Yeah. <laughs> or his trade party. Because it seems like a number of, like, Mongol notables had, like, put up the capital for it. Oh. So it was, like, the Mongol leadership themselves who, uh, lost money on that. Yeah, I can imagine they got pretty pissed about that. <laughs> a hit, and it's been described as a hit to the 13th century equivalent of the pocketbook. Yep. And, oh yeah, right there, the... So, the, uh, so... Uh, Chinggis uh, declares war, he marches on Persia, he tries to warn um, uh, Sultan Muhammad that, hey, I can absolutely wreck you, and of course the Sultan kind of does an overconfident laugh, and, uh, but then Chinggis uh, uh, starts to really turn up the heat on the Khwarezmids, and he shows up right at Ochar, and he absolutely just wrecks the whole place, because obviously of what they did. Uh, what they did with the Mongols down there, and I believe uh, this is where they find Inalchuk, and Inalchuk tries to desperately beg for his life, and Chinggis is like, I'm 500% done with you, tried to bullshit out of negotiating with me, so you want my wealth so bad? Here. Here's some molten silver. Drink it. All of it. Just like that scene from Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones I believe. There. That's the that's the, fa the famous inspiration uh, for it. Yeah. So mo molten silver, silver into his eyes and ears. Yep. Which is just the worst. Yeah, that's got to be one heck of a way to go. <laughs> and then, of course, the Mongols closed in on other towns. I believe here in my notes mentioned as uh, Sugak Hassan. Yeah. Uh, let me just make things easier for you. They close in on every town in the Khwarezmian Empire. <laughs> and slaughter everything. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's... If, if you... Uh, let me make this a bit... E if you're gonna try going in and describe every single town Juvani describes as falling, we're gonna be here all day. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right about that, yeah. So, so they Juvani provides us the most detailed description of the famous Khwarezmian campaign. Yeah. Shah Muhammad flees immediately, basically leaving every city in the empire to its own defense. Yeah. And he describes in detail a number of them. Uh, normally, with it, but it's a lot of variations of the Mongols showed up, made their demands, people resisted. In three days, Mongols were through the walls, people then driven out onto the plains before the city. And slaughtered. Slaughtered towers of skulls, every living thing, this and that. It's it's gruesome. It is, and Juve, Juveni is. I yeah, it's what we mentioned at the beginning. The sort of he, it, how he's describing Hulagu as the more civilized conqueror. So that that's he goes from this mental gymnastics of just. This flood of just absolute horrendous devastation on these innocent Muslims to ah now here's Hulagu who is so much gentler and <laughs> this and that like it's uh <laughs> like it, it's fast but we're, we're very lucky for it that we have such just wonderful detailed description of the campaign uh, which is supported by a couple other authors and eyewitnesses from the period. Juvani actually was not an eyewitness. He was born right. after a couple of years afterwards, but his father and grandfather both uh, they were witnesses survived it. it. <laughs> yeah, uh, they they both worked for the Khorizm Shahs. So yeah, uh, we, we are very grateful it exists. I'm sure Juvani was not uh, like in the time he's writing. He, he mentions like if specific towns have actually like come back since the invasion. 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah, he writes about 50, so it would be like 30, 30 years prior. Yeah. Uh, 
that. If you're like interested in learning the Mongol invasion of the Horizmian Empire, finding uh, John A. Boyle, John A. Boyle's uh, translation online is very easy. And Giovanni, despite what we've harped on him, is actually not a hard read, and it literally just takes you through the movements of the armies, all this sort of thing. Uh, it's it's a marvelous, marvelous work. Ter- terribly unfortunate, but we're very lucky to have it. Yes, indeed. And I believe, uh, and I believe there's all sorts of very, very brutal tactics here, like. For example, I believe over at I believe the siege of the siege of Nur, the the it is described that the Mongols are actually filling in the moat of the of the city of Nur with the with with bodies just to get their siege engines over it. That and, was what's one of the the, the tactics Juvani described. It's called the Hashar, and it's basically you take the captured citizens from the previous city you took or the outlying villages force them before your army their job is to fill in the the moats either with dirt rocks trees their own bodies they're pushing up the siege equipment but also they're in the front lines so now the enemy archers are just they're shooting at the guys pushing the siege equipment so they're shooting at their own men their own countrymen, so that's going to hurt their morale. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's going to soak up their arrows, so it's saving Mongol lives, because that's the jobs with the siege equipment, that's, you know, the most dangerous. That's when you're exposed right. to the enemy archers and all that. Uh, and they have to dig under cities, and it's literally filling bodies with their moats. Um, Juvani describes during the pursuit to Shah Muhammad mm. that um, what was the city? Not Nakhichivan. Uh, Shemaki in uh, Azerbaijan. Mm-hmm. The Mong... What the? I think the Skype screen might have froze. Jack? Um, I'll figure this out in just a bit. So, hey, we're a little back. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties that we've encountered. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so... Uh, I think I was describing uh, Javut Subade getting over the walls of this city in the Caucasus. And so what they built a ramp out of the corpses of uh, local peasants, local local animals. Oh, and it, no. This is what Giovanni's describing. So he describes it as, for three days they were using this ramp to get up over the walls and fight until the ramp decomposed and collapsed. Oh, the awkward! Uh, it's a uh, wondrous detail. Uh, it's, you know, you're kind of wondering, is this just Giovanni... Uh, playing this up for you know the shock value, but to show how terrible the Mongols are, but you then you're like, oh, it's not really that all, all that different from other uh, tactics they're using. So yeah, the Mongols were just a very were just very brutal conquerors, and this, as far as I know, is corroborated with all sort of, with like the records of how the Jin were annihilated. The Song didn't get much better, obviously. The Xia barely even existed after the Mongols happened to them. Yeah. So, so all, all the, the, the famous stories of towers of skulls outside of city walls and Nishapur uh, being destroyed and not a living thing left inside, even cats, rats, and dogs killed, those are all coming from Juvani, as yeah. well as the numbers of where, oh, 1.3 million people were killed at this city or 1 million killed at this city. Yeah, which is there, there's some doubt over some doubt, a lot of doubt over the accuracy of those numbers because he'll describe a million people being killed at this city, and then the Mongols coming back a couple of days later and still finding more people to kill, which is well, so probably when he's saying these huge numbers, it's best to sort of think of Juvani as 
saying the 13th century Persian equivalent of a lot of people died. A huge amount of people died that we couldn't even really count, but he's giving these numbers. Yeah, that makes Not sense. Literally a million people died, but like just a huge percentage of the people of this town. Uh, especially since there's a couple locations he describes where it's like, oh, a million people were killed, and then uh, later in the work, ah, and now this site is back to the level of prosperity it was before the Mongols, which is... <laughs> I find which, unlikely. Where did you... Where did all these people come from, but... Yeah. And it's best... He sort of remarks, not directly on it, but there'd be a lot of... Uh, in addition to people being killed, is people fleeing their homes, running away from the Mongols, escaping them, so... You have those numbers adding to uh, the population, like from those killed with swords. It's those people who ran away, those people killed in the famine, which is following the Mongols, because the Mong, you know, all the farms are now left desolated. Right. Uh, a big consequence of the Mongol invasion is the destruction of a lot of the irrigation systems of Central Asia and Eastern Persia. Right. Uh, which is how a lot of these farms, vineyards, are uh, ruined and then left, well, unable to produce a lot of the food stuff necessary for the following. Uh, yeah, one part that comes out routinely in Juvani's descriptions of these fall of the cities is the Mongols making setting up camp or hiding in the orchards outside of the cities. Right. So than, uh, that makes uh, sense. You they, know, you you think of these, you know, Muslim cities as like in the middle of deserts and stuff. No, Juvani is repeatedly describing these were very lush, prosperous cities until the Mongols. Until the Mongols happened, enforced uh, desertification. Right. So, it, as far as I know, records of uh, often uh, uh, modern interpretation was often described that. Uh, the level, the carbon dioxide levels of the planet at that time actually went down by like seventy five percent just because the Mongols went to town and decided to create their giant empire. It's I don't know, I'm not so much on the science side of a lot of these. Uh, I you, know, you hear those articles. Oh, this was a wetter, colder period. Oh, uh, Mongols caused uh, this offset in global. CO2 levels and stuff. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I don't personally know it, but I sometimes wonder if that's just the scientists did this reading and went, oh, that's the same period as the Mongols. They must have... Uh, mm, I don't know. That's positive. That does sound like a lot to blame on them. Yeah, so I'm not saying it's wrong, but uh... Like, I, I guess it, it's possible from the point of view, oh, they, they killed so many people that uh, uh, this reduction in agriculture and also the uh, reduction in, say, amount of trees being cut down by these people now. So uh, it, that means there's less CO2 being produced, more being absorbed by the environment. Because agriculture, that turning over of the soil, uh, raising animals, cattle, that sort of thing, that produces lots of CO2, uh, right. methane, that kind of thing. Is it just because they, they killed a lot of people and it affected uh, these global levels? I don't know, because this is also the 13th century is the start of the so-called Little Ice Age. Right. There's sort of a general cooling weather period in the Earth's climate. So that might have just been a reflection of something related to that. Uh, so for instance, 14th century China is just terrible with exceptionally cold, cold winters, wet years. Uh, right. It's so it's the environmental stuff. I the Mongols may have been affected by it, uh, especially like the late 12th century seems to have been very dry. So there's sort of an increase in desertification in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Birds don't do as well, which is offsetting the uh, conflict between Temujin and Jamukha and them. And then the 13th century is wetter, so that this increase in 
pasture, which is a boon in animals and mongols. But I think that sometimes presented and sort of like reduced to just, oh, 13th century was wet, so this led to the Mongol Empire, which is... A bit much. You know, for, yeah, it's kind of, instead of going A, B, C, D, we just went from A to G. Yeah. Uh, right, cut out everything in between, so... Yeah, I can imagine. So I, I believe with a lot of the various battles of uh, various battles that rage across the course of mid empire and just the whole empire just getting wrecked and devastated, there's just absolutely not much left, and there's all sorts of indiscriminate slaughter. Even considering that the Mongols are supposed to have this religious toleration, there's also a uh, lot and some stuff uh, like showing them like burning moss, sla slaughtering all sorts of cities, remainder sort of slaves. It's just lots of brutal slaughtering as usual with the Mongols, and I believe about uh, apparently one of the small bright spots for the Khorasanids in particular is uh, a little bit of Jalal al Din who carries on as much as he can with a guerrilla campaign. He cut The records of him that I've seen from Germany kind of uh, vaguely remind me of Edmund, of Edmund Ironsides, the noble resistor of uh, Canute the Great over in England, uh, I believe a couple centuries back. And there are, of course, uh, more cities I uh, taken right around this time. Uh, Balak specifically is taken and just brutally slaughtered. The usual, everything is just wrecked. And right here they have, and Jal Din actually manages to make a rather uh, major, uh, major success where he gets attacked, I believe, by uh, Tekachuk. And yeah, there's two minor generals. Yep. And and he and the, Jalal actually manages to defeat him. And but of course the Mongols aren't going to just let that one little defeat slide, so he is pursued and anybody that stands in between the Mongols and getting after Jalal then is summarily slaughtered. And Jal and and, and Jal continues to evade capture, but unfortunately, as he reaches, I believe the as he reaches the boundaries of India, right around the Hindu Kush, he loses what little army, he, what little army he has. Well, he uh, defeats uh, Shigi Kutuku at Parvan. Yep, and in the aftermath of that. It's not like a huge victory, but it was a victory. But his army starts fighting over loot, and half of his army, uh, because of the argument, just abandons him. So by the time Chinggis captures him at the Indus River with his full army, Jalal al Din has just like half of his force, and right, it, it could only end one way by uh, yeah, by that point. And so, and then that's what we have. So, Juvani records twice slightly different versions of uh, the rather famous episode Jalal al Din riding his horse off the cliff into the river and getting into the other side, his weapons and armor still held proud. Yeah. And Juvani puts into the mouth of Chingas that every father would dream to have a son like that. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, giving like nine looks at his own son. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and Jal then gets into India and I believe he is not exactly treated too well by the local ruler there, uh, Salar, ah uh, uh, Salar Ahmed. And he is actually bound in what is, I believe, known as the Girdle of Submission. <laughs> Kind of sounds like the actual 13th century equivalent of a chastity belt. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jalal al Din, he sort of has that unfortunate Khorasmian tendency of just betraying and attacking everyone nearby. Awkward! His father, grandfather, and it's just, he, his relations in India, like, started off poor because the in, uh, 
the states in India, none of them trusted the Khorasmians. They had been fighting them as the Gurids. Right. And with the breakup of the Gurids, and you have uh, the Sultanate of Delhi, Kubasha and Multan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they all... So they didn't trust them to start off with... Uh, and then Jalaluddin just starts betraying and attacking people, and you end up... It seems that they basically formed this coalition of all the states in North India to try and push Jalaluddin out. <laughs> and he eventually just escapes and uh, runs into western Persia to meet up or to fight like his half-brother for control of whatever territory his half-brother was holding on to. Right, right. And I, and I believe there are some there are also some parties of Mongols actually sent in pursuit of Jalatin and they, they don't exactly do too well, sadly. Uh, uh, Nandana, I believe, is uh, n- sent down there, and he and his forces are uh, forced back by bad weather. They kind of just lose everything. It's not great. And then I believe uh, Subadai is also sent after the, uh, sent a- sent after Jalaldin, and they slaughter a local town known as uh, Zaba for supplies. And then briefly here they. They mentioned that uh, Khorasan unfortunately got a very terrible earthquake, and but at the end of the day, Jaladin avoids capture, and Subade eventually uh, goes back to do other things for the Mongol Empire. Because, well, what can I say? It's got to keep on expanding, right? <laughs> so. There is, unfortunately, at this time period, a, a brief revolt in Iraq led by uh, Jamal al-Din i Abba, but he is very, and he tries to do everything that he can to resist the uh, resist. I believe uh, was left. I think of the Khorasmids, I read the Mongols, and but he but he doesn't stick around for very long and. He gets destroyed, and then there are more massacres following. So Yemi is the guy who crushes him. Yem is a servant of the Mongols. My mistakes, and more massacres continue. And eventually, Yem and Subade uh, meet up over at uh, Khorasan, which tries to uh, not submit to the Mongols, even though they still have earthquake problems. And uh, the whole town is very easily slaughtered, uh, a little bit of rebuilding. And apparently Shah Muhammad's still somehow around, but and this is where he continues to be pursued. And, of, and, and after that, Merv is also slaughtered, because it, ga- it, it briefly gave shelter to Shah Muhammad. As usual, the Mongols just find cities that... Tried to help out uh, the last uh, shot of the one, of the last shots of the Khorasmids, and as usual, anything that stands between them and the Khorasmids is very quickly destroyed. And apparently, Muhammad is getting into a bit of a uh, I have crippling depression because everything is just falling apart all around me. The empire that my ancestors built up, everything, and now the Mongols just happen to just step right in and destroy everything in sight. He just, Shah Muhammad basically, as Juvani describes, he just, as soon as the Mongols crossed the uh, Amudarya, he just fled. Seven Subude were sent in pursuit of him, and he spends like the last year of his life just like running from like modern. Uh, Uzbekistan, I believe, that goes through Turkmenistan to Iran, sort of like like a little like a pinball machine, like ding 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 ding. All right, into the Caucasus, da, da, da. and he finally ends up dying on a small island in the Caspian Sea with just like his son or like some of his sons around him. Like they said, he was so poor they had to bury him in like just the clothes he had on him. Uh, and that I think I don't know if it's Juvani or but they say it's like pneumonia. I think Juvani basically just says like he was just crushed, like his spirit was just crushed by everything that had happened, and gave up on his will to 
to live sort of thing. <laughs> Sounds suspiciously like that prequel movie we mentioned earlier. <laughs> Uh, I think like it says like he was going delirious at the end, and he's like handing out to like his the few followers with him. He's like, "Oh, oh I have just made you the the shah of uh, this town. I've just given you this territory, and it's like he's handing out titles that are no longer his to give." Yeah, like, it's, it's a pretty pathetic end to a guy who a year and a half prior was calling himself the second Alexander. <laughs> you know, it's, uh... Yeah. All just before the Mongols came in and wrecked everything, and here, of course, more slaughtering is coming. And here, I believe, uh, uh, Jermaine mentions that famous 1.3 million kill count. I believe on. Uh, I believe on one of the cities. I and, think it's Nishapur. Yeah, Nishapur, yeah, that's about right. And. Uh, and then, uh, of course, and then there's another guy mentioned here, I believe, uh, Zia Adin. Uh, he kind of likes the Mongols, but the Sultan, of course, uh, but Shah Muhammad, in one of his uh, last acts, kind of absolutely ruins him with whatever little he has. And there's also a little bit of supply difficulties at, I believe, the attack on Merv. But, of course... Just more indiscriminate slaughter, and every and everybody is also very depressed at in Nishapur just before the Mongols show up. Anyway, it's, it's very it, there's kind of almost I believe a a, a procession of uh, almost flagellants just run uh, just running around whipping themselves, blaming themselves for all the Holocaust that's basically being wreaked upon them. Well, uh, Nishapur. Outside the walls, um, I think the year before they had shot and killed uh, Chinggis's son-in-law Tokuchar. Ah, uh. so it was. I think like initially they're like, ah, yeah, we showed you Mongols what's what, and then Tolui shows up with just his massive army, and they realize, oh, we fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> we fucked up yeah. big time. <laughs> uh, surrender. No, <laughs> we've had everything yeah. <laughs> because we're models. Was like singularly, <laughs> or like especially singled out for uh, some harsh treatment. It's pretty. It's it's terrible stuff. It's I mean, it's like forty odd pages of just this city falls, this population killed, this city falls, this population killed. Yeah, uh, on and on. It's. Ugh. Yeah, just more stuff going right through here. Nishapur's, uh, 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 Nishapur is busted. Uh, Subzavar is busted. All all sorts of things happen here. And put it this way: the names of the city and the location and the numbers change. The outcome doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's just all slaughter from here. <laughs> and and then. After the after the cordsmen are just absolutely wrecked, with very little of them left, with uh, Shah Muhammad pro- uh, dying from his crippling depression, <laughs> the, pneumonia, <laughs> and pneumonia, and, and, and Chinggis uh, decides he needs to go into another side project because somebody didn't send troops to help me fight the cordsmen, and that is most definitely the Shah. <laughs> The and the the Tanguts are, and, and then the Tanguts are slaughtered. Chinggis dies. The inheritance is uh, divided up, and everybody has to say as to Ogadai. Of course, uh, uh, Ogadai. Of course, uh, I believe Jermaine briefly mentions here that uh, Chinggis Han died exactly as basically every, every other source I've read has corroborated, falling off the horse and dying of the. A wound infections that came thereafter. Um, I think he actually says something like uh, the insolubility of the climate or something. Oh, like, yeah. Uh, because he doesn't. Because I did my own video on uh, death that Chinggis there, and yeah, Giovanni's version. It's um, not the, like it's the same like general outline. Like oh, it's the. He destroys the Tangut kingdom, but he dies just sort of at the end of it there. 
mm-hmm. or it's a general destruction. But it's some. I he is he is a very imprecise kind of like uh, doing owing to the insolubility of the climates. You know, Ching just sort of succumbs to something. Yeah, you know, some kind of disease or or uh, something like that. It's very like the, the the book. The whole work's called "The History of the World Conqueror," named after Chingism. When it comes to his death, he's just kind of like shrugged and went, "I climb it or something," I guess. Mm-hmm. So, yep. And I believe, of course, immediately after the whole inheritance is split, Chingis is vastly mourned by his family, the empire in general, and so on. Because, well, you kind of have to mourn the greatest guy that ever happened to Mongol history. And then, um, and his uh, funeral procession is apparently accompanied, at least as far as Giovanni says, by 46 maidens. Kind of makes you think of, like, uh, what Marco Polo described as how uh, 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 Genghis Khan was buried. Like, Genghis is escorted to this very secret spot with all these girls, and anything on site is killed indiscriminately, and... And then, of course, they get to the burial site. Everybody is killed. Genghis is buried. Uh, Genghis himself is buried. The executioners are also killed. Then the executioners of the executioners are also killed. Very dramatic, but also it's just like... That is some real uh, literary reaching, because I don't think the Mongols have actually pulled out that many logistics. It kind of actually reminds me of... Uh, I, I think a story also attributed to, to the time of Attila the Hun's death, where there, he's escorted to the same su- uh, to a super secret spot in Hungary, and same thing happens. Yeah, I think most of the sources on Shingus's death. There's the same. This general outline is death after Tanga, escorted to Mongolia, uh, buried in a secret spot, and then they differ on. Was everyone killed along the way? Or in some later versions, oh, the caravan gets stuck outside a mountain, or um, was there maidens? I think another, I don't remember the source, I think it's you and she, or you and she, mm-hmm. uh, which is that uh, Ergodai. So he has the maidens, they're sent by Ergodai like a couple years afterwards, or, or not. Like, not with the burial in the first place, but after Ergodai became Khan, he sent them to, like, oh, you should accompany my grandfather, or you should accompany my father, and then sent the maidens up to be executed and buried. Buried with, so. Most of the details, like, specific details like that on, like, Chinggis's death and stuff, because the general pattern's always the same, but, like, the specific details change. It's sort of best to go, oh, that's the version Juvani heard. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. But, there's, all, but, not everything is all and well in the Mongol Empire. For instance, Jalal al-Din is still kicking around, apparently. And, uh, another general sent after him, specifically, uh, Tormakan, and, the, and the Volga Bulgars are also being campaigned against in the West. And this campaign is specifically led by Subade and Kokote. And the Jin are also mopped up very quickly shortly thereafter. It's a, it's a fairly rapid fire campaign all the way to the all the way to Kaifeng, and the Jin pull out all the stops. They're just like, We're gonna throw out this bomb and that bomb, this crazy bomb, all this gunpowder, and what happened? Yeah, the Mongols are still here. They breach our city and they're slaughtering everything in sight. All this, all this effort, and we still lose. Darn. <laughs> too little, too late. <laughs> Maybe you should just, I don't know, not help the Tatars poison Chinggis' dad next time. <laughs> oh well, hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> and of course, and I believe. There's more stuff here. The Turkish uh, soldiers uh, show up at one of the uh, Jin cities, uh, Ho Chongfu, and everything is slaughtered there as usual. 
and everything just does not work out for the gene, for for the gene saver. They're just absolutely just being wrecked. They uh, the weather is apparently also not on their side either. <laughs> At least as far as Giovanni's concerned, and uh, and finally, ev and, fi and, and finally. And finally, the Kaifeng is taken. The Jin Emperor burns himself alive with his family. Everything just has gone to absolute hell for the Jin. And I believe they get a new bit of administration in, by the way of a guy named Aziz Yalavach. Hope I'm not totally butchering the pronunciation there. Yalavach? Uh, Mahmoud Yalavach. Yeah. I guess... Maybe Giovanni has a by different. Uh, or it could be his. What's the son's name? That could no, be. No, the right. son is Masud Beg. Ah, uh, I think I've heard about so, him. But he's. Yeah, he, so he is uh, early in Ergodai's reign. Uh, Mahmoud Yalavaj is appointed. Yiki uh, Daurubachi of sort of the Turkestan. They sort of. The Mongol Empire in this time is sort of in like three main administrative zones. Uh, it's Transoxania, region between the Amudarya, Sirdarya, Turkestan, sort of right. from the Sirdarya to Mongolia, and then North China administrative. So, yeah, I can imagine. Mamu, in sort of this period there, uh, Mamu Hyalov actually is kind of. His name pops up a lot because he's he has his fingers in a lot of pies, and he does work in North China for a bit as well, I believe. Ah, makes sense. Makes sense. I don't remember. It's a lot of that later empire. It sort of ends up being a lot of guys reappointed and then taken out and appointed somewhere else and then back into that old position they were in. Let's get succession of another ruler, and then they're cleaned out. New guys appointed. That person dies. That's yeah. out. Those guys were your point. It's uh, yep. It's a bit because you'll be reading and be like, "I just read about you in China. What are you doing over here <laughs> in Uzbekistan?" Yeah, well, and it's very much all sorts of celebration of yay, the Jin are gone, <laughs> and of course, and Monka is also briefly mentioned here because he is with the party that is sacking Kaifeng, and they are. And he continues to express his loyalty. Oh yeah, that's going to work out very well in a couple years down the line. Just kind of foreshadowing from my point of view. <laughs> and I believe they briefly mention here the attack on the Kipchaks, which is led by uh, Batu, Han, Monka, and uh, Guyuk. And uh, of course, and this and this campaign eventually. Um, it escalates to getting all the way to like Poland, Hungary. It's just all the usual indiscriminate stuff. And uh, also, Giovanni here mentions that uh, Ogadai apparently had quite the drinking party. <laughs> Typical of a Jinga Sidair, as usual. <laughs> because, boy, they know how to party. <laughs> yeah, Ogadai, uh, he, he, uh, he went hard. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot more partying here as usual, and I guess this is still in this uh, post uh, Tolui death era, because Tolui doesn't outlive his dad for very long. He's basically the first Tolui, kid. Yeah, kid. Tolui dies before the fall of Kaifeng, so like twelve thirty two, twelve thirty three, I think. Yeah, he walks out. With a, he walks out of his tent in a terrible hangover and dies. It's kind of just like that's what, what happened to the son of Chinggis Han. Kind of lame. In sacred history, he gives uh, Ogredai falls sick, and Tolui uh, gives up his soul, so like in exchange to the spirits, so that they will let Ogredai go. And Juvani, Tolui drinks himself to death, which is. <laughs> I think that's probably the more realistic outcome because. <laughs> yeah. So which one was the uh, propaganda? One. I think so, I'll probably go with uh, the secret history being propaganda there. <laughs> well, and then, so, Juvani does a very interesting thing. Uh, he routinely ref refers to Tolui 
as Ulokondoyan. Oh. Which is something like Good Commander, something like that. But he does that because the Mongols had a taboo against mentioning people after, uh, about talking about death, about mentioning death specifically, and using or, and using the names of uh, people who had died. Oh. So, totally during Ergadai's reign, it seems his name was just totally taboo, and was just uh, Ulugnoyan. So you're referring to him kind of indirectly without using his own name. Uh, it's see, it's argued that totally also or that Juveni is also using uh, Ulushidi, or is also mentions mentions an Ulush ID. Ah, yeah, which is sometimes seems to have been that seems to have been the posthumous name for Jochi. Oh! And that Juvedi didn't quite understand why sometimes they're talking about, oh, sometimes Juchi's attacking the city, sometimes it's Ulushidi. So he seems to have sort of used it as, oh, these were just two commanders working together. Like, Ulushidi was a sub-commander to Juchi sort of thing. Makes sense. So... So, I believe uh, here they also mentioned that rather famous story about how Chagatai is so uh, committed to enforcing the Yasa. Yeah, where, they're, where they find this one guy bathing in the river, and they hold the one guy in custody, and then they find out how absolutely poor the guy is, and uh, he gets helped out, and... Helped out by Ergadai. Right, Ergadai. right, helped out by Ergadai. there. The stories are to illustrate how good and kind and generous Ergadai was. It's not nothing, nothing to do with the Mongols as a or as Chagatai. He he's always stirring. He's sort of the the yin and yang of the right. Yeah, but to be fair, that the Yasa did get the Mongols pretty far, so it makes sense, I guess, in some sort of context that Chagatai would want to enforce it. <laughs> And he, he he took it like that's sort of like unanimous across Muslim sources at a period are Chagatai's just going all out and forcing the Yasa. I think even in the secret history it mentions Chagatai being very strict, very like by the rules kind of guy. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh so it seems that he's sometimes presented as like in modern like written books written books, like uh fiction and stuff is like oh he was just very angry and all this stuff I don't think that was the case I think this was a guy who was just very strict saw this as his father's laws and that they had to be always always enforced kind of uh kind of thing well and, that, yeah well that strictness does kind of save him in the end to some extent because he kind of is the Last man standing amongst all the sons of Chinggis, and his line really manages to outlast everyone, so good on him. Yeah, yes, I don't know how much we want to brag about the stability of the Chagatai uh, <laughs> conlight, though. Uh, yeah. Or, 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 he outlasted Ergodai by like a year, so. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it kind of worked, <laughs> as it's, usual. It's like, technically, yes, outlasted the others, but. You know, the Chagatai Khanite was like immediately after his death, kind of the the red headed stepchild of the of the, the rump state. <laughs> yeah, not not very not, doesn't do very much, but it somehow still sticks around <laughs> in one form or another. But it doesn't obviously retain that much power. It just happens to retain some level of territorial integrity, some people acknowledging its existence, and so on. And, of course, under uh, Ogadai's reign, uh, Karakoram is built, and there's a lot of, uh, but it's mostly a lot of, it's mostly some a, a giant trade depot. It's not all that magnificent. Yeah. It's sort of the administrative, rather than trying to hunt for the Khan, because the Khan's is going to be wherever. Yeah. It's, oh, okay, you know you can go to Karakoram, and there's going to be the administrative that's the base of the administrative apparatus. So you can find his representatives there. It's a good place to, like you say, basically store loot <laughs> uh, kind of thing. 
and it's in Mongolia, so it has the uh, that value to the Mongols. So yep. that they can keep living in Mongolia, and then, oh, Erg and I can stop by the capital every couple months and mm -hmm. not sign some papers, because I think he was certainly illiterate. Yeah. But stamp some papers, that would be it. Yep. And uh, and there's a lot of activity. And there's uh, some other activities that also go on around uh, throughout the city. I believe specifically uh, wrestling, which of course the Mongols absolutely love to death. And they specifically mention uh, one guy who is uh, Jaz uh, Tazik, uh, and he is of course very uh, and of course he's very popular. And but and he. Uh, is very he's very popular. He's very famous. The Mongols absolutely love watching him, like he's some sort of football athlete. And but he apparently isn't much for uh, lady company because he stays celibate to stay in shape. <laughs> but eventually, uh, no, wait, it's no, wait, I actually mixed up here. So it's the so Tazik is actually his nationality. He is from the Tazik tribe, but his name is uh, Palavan Fila. But eventually he's uh, pushed to retire because, well, eventually you had to uh, put out some time, and who wouldn't want to be in the hottest wrestler in all of Mongolia? <laughs> 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 yeah. And, 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 here after, and here, well, apparently one of his last ones is, a, the last r matches before he retires is a match against his relative uh, Muhammad Shan or whatever, and they r and they wrestle, but uh, I believe Giovanni does not mention the victor. And of course, right and and there's a brief coverage of like Guyu getting his part of the inheritance, while um, which um, while Ogadai officially moves into Karakoram. And here there is a bit of praise for Monka, which I guess isn't surprising because uh, Giovanni is covering the, uh, all this stuff from the Toluid angle. Mm -hmm. Well, Monka is uh, still con with yeah. uh, Giovanni's writing, so... Yeah. Yeah, very much still con, I believe. I don't think he dies... I don't think his death is mentioned in the work. I don't think so either. It, it would have been like the time they found out about it would have been. Oh no, sorry. Yeah, afterwards, Merck dies twelve fifty nine. Right. So yeah, Baghdad falls twelve fifty eight, and we know he doesn't mention the uh, sack of Baghdad. So yeah, <laughs> and of uh, course. And then Torajin takes over uh, immediately after Ogadai's uh, death from rampant alcoholism, and she holds on and manages to hold on till the cruel tie election to elect his successor. There is a lot of courtiers purged at this time, and the Yalavach is actually uh, recalled to uh, is actually recalled. And but Yalavash knows that something's probably up because there's a lot of people going out, so he actually decides to uh, ignore the summons and run all the way to Kotem, where he is uh, somewhat ignored. And here, Torjin is first mentioned as uh, being friends with Fatima, who is just a who is, as far as I know, a servant girl uh, brought a Muslim servant girl brought in and. Uh, Torjin and, and Fatima kind of find this uh, the solidarity and friendship in the sense of we're not in a great situation, but we can at least still be friends on the at the end of it. And Guyu, but Guyuk, of course, uh, doesn't and uh, doesn't like uh, Fatima's uh, undue foreign influence, as I'll put it. And as everything is just going wrong, uh, Sorkuk Tani decides to uh, lay low with her heirs, those being uh, Monka, Kublai, Arik Boke, and Karahulegu. And this is as the Karotai is called. Um, 
An uh, one of the uh, another small official tries to uh, by the name of Otegen tries to uh, coup no, and tries to have oh, a coup. Otegen, that's um, uh, Tamuga, Temujin's youngest surviving brother. Oh, Otegen is it's a title, the Prince of the Hearth. That's what the youngest son uh, gets titled. Oh, so he's so he tries to uh, uh, get in and tries to make himself Khan, and. He talks with uh, somebody named Mengli Ogle, and Tor and Torjin uh, continues, and Tor and Torjin continues to be regent, and I believe she dies around twelve forty six. yes, shortly after Guyuk becomes Khan, because yeah. there's there's some speculation he had a hand in her death because it's kind of a uh, timing wise. Oh, Gu becomes he, Han. He, he, he yeah, that's Han, and then all of a sudden, oh, Torgen is dead. Oh, uh, Fatima is arrested. Oh, right. Yes, and put on put on uh, very Han dramatic Han. trial. <laughs> yeah, sort of preview for Oval Commission. Her awful death. Oh yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. And so here they briefly mention uh, Fatima's backstory of how she was carried off into Karakorum from the shrine of Aliar Riza, and she, but of course Guyuk doesn't like her. Doesn't like her. He accuses Fatima of bewitching his mother. <laughs> That's an easy way for him to not frame Torajim for being in his way. It just so happens that Fatima was this powerful witch who bewitched my righteous mother. Yes. My <laughs> I will never forgive her. To be, just happens to be dead. Oh and yes. Stop with this. Ah, <laughs> oh, my powerful, overbearing mother. Indeed. Yeah, you can see why they're they're a little suspicious about uh, how how it's presented. Yeah. But. But yeah. also, too, it's it's important to remember most a lot of the sources don't have much good things to say about Guyuk. Like yeah. he's sort of he's the con that everyone else forgets about when they're listing off the great cons in the 13th right. century. They're tr it's a short reign; he doesn't have time to do too much. But he seems to have gotten kind of the, sh the short end of the stick. So th there's an interesting article by. Um, Oh, I don't remember the name. Hold on, Kim, I think. Uh, reassessment of Guyuk, sort of. When you go to sources outside of, like, the approved stuff by the Empire, right? And, and you, you kind of see that, okay, maybe Guyuk wasn't that bad, but in all the Tolu to lead stuff, like, he just gets... Yeah, know, butchered. His reputation's just ripped apart. Makes sense. So... All to justify their very convenient takeover immediately after his death. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and not to say he didn't suspiciously murder his mother and Fatima. He probably did. It's, it's, it's a little too coincidental. They both happened to die just after his uh, succession. But yeah. other than that, he might have been. <laughs> he might have been guy. just an amazing guy. Uh, Javani does mention that he's trying to be generous and give out the gifts of... A little bit of a young man after Ogadai's heart, possibly. Hmm. And and he and here they appoint some new leaders. Uh, Brugate gets to be in charge of the Uyghurs, and another guy running around in the cruel tie uh, by the name of Ali Koja accuses uh, Sh Shira uh, Sh uh, Shiva or Shira of assassinating Guyuk. And of also apparently bewitching him. Just more, just more witchcraft trials. Was this Salem? <laughs> it's well, because the Mongols really don't like uh, people using magic, so it was sort of an easy way to get them to sort of agree to throwing someone in a river to go. Ah, she's a witch. <laughs> <laughs> kind of ironic considering some of the records that go around uh, 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 that are surround uh, Genghis's deeds <laughs> like for example his uh, his attack upon the Tongoots as described I believe over in uh, the Golden History 
Oh yeah, well, well that's that's later. That's <laughs> that's the Buddhist influence. Now you now you can transform into an animal. Fine, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> what is this monkey king? <laughs> <laughs> but with uh, see Chingus and the shaman, or uh, well, see with Chingus, he was ordained by heaven to be great. So it's okay if he's invoking the power of heaven. Right. That was sort of a designated and necessary role to have that contact with the spirits. Uh, but they had a lot of responsibilities in the tribe. Ah. Uh, people outside of that using magic, uh, outside of the shamans or the Khan using magic. Yeah, that's a no-no. <laughs> You can't, you can't trust that. You don't know what sort of bad luck they're going to... You want to have Heaven's favor, and you can't have someone going around using magic. Oh, Ooh, no! Trouble they'll bring on you. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I believe uh, Shira is very quickly bound and killed, and Ali Koja is not rewarded for his uh, apparently righteous accusation of Shira, because he is also beaten to death. And Munka is actually informed about uh, Otegin's uh, little coup. And the, and the Kurultai is officially called, and, uh, and Batu is unable to be there personally, because he's got lots of campaigning to do. A uh, gout, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that Almost. too. One of the one of his excuses for not attending is uh, gout. Yeah, I think I remember something like that yeah, vaguely that was mentioned. Guliuk, he couldn't come. Said uh, Guliuk kept calling him, and he couldn't come because he had gout and he couldn't travel. Yeah, but uh, the Golden Horde is represented here by, I believe, uh, Horde Berka. I I I don't think it was I don't think it was Berke. I think it was a a guy by the name of Hordu. Oh, Not... Orda. So that's uh, Batu's older brother. Oh, very important. And he does his son uh, Sartok to spend some time. Ah. Yeah. It might also be there. But I know Merka is there at some point too because right. uh, uh, Hulu, Hulu was described as not liking Berka because he found him like very command, like overbearing, always giving commands, and like just like a real pain in the ass. To be fair, that's that that does match up with, I believe, a recent article. Uh, a recent article about uh, the second uh, about the second Mongol invasion of Hungary that uh, that you sent over to me, where like uh, yeah. where like Berke is making these giant threats to Hungary of. Hey, don't don't raid me, don't attack me, or I will slaughter everything. Slaughter everything you own. Yeah, Berka was kind of a a prick. <laughs> I think was kind of just uh, what I what I've gotten from the sources. Yeah, I can imagine uh, that invading. Ah, oh, I want Azerbaijan. <laughs> no, I want uh, Azerbaijan. No, I'm going to slaughter everything. <laughs> ah, he's a. <laughs> But yeah, anyways, Batu helps uh, Mank become Great Khan in 1250. Yeah. That is the so-called Toluid Revolution, which in Juvani's narrative now brings on and ushers in a new era of peace and prosperity and we should all just submit to the Mongols because Merka, you know, he's... He's a stand-up guy! <laughs> he's cutting out all the corruption, he's getting rid of all the corrupt officials, draining the swamp, you might say. <laughs> and, uh, doing all... America is, is generally pr portrayed as, like, a period of, like, increased imperial centralization, you know, stronger imperial control, bypassing sort of the princes and governors who've, and officials who've established themselves across the empire, and going, okay... Rather than going through all these middlemen, now it's just my officials are going there, and it's from that official to the great con. No longer is your taxes going through this guy who's taking some off the top, then this guy who's taking some off the top, this guy who's taking some off the top. Nope. Yeah. More efficient. He I, he did um, simplify the taxation system. You know, cut out a lot of the taxes, a lot of the tax farming, that sort of thing. That, 
appointed uh, new guy, set people off on new campaigns. And oh, what would have been had he lived another mm-hmm. couple years longer? Yeah, just sort of uh, a great what if of history. Another, oh. that, that famous, that favorite uh, pastime of Mongol Khans, which is dying unexpectedly early. <laughs> Either that, or just thinks there are drinking problems. I don't think those two things are unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably true, but I think it's. I think probably like the thing is like Munka and Kublai aren't all that different. So Kublai probably would continue a lot of, the, of Munka um, of Munka's policies, and uh, Mon- uh, Kublai continued a lot of Munka's policies, and well, look what happened to him. <laughs> yeah, well, in some respects, but. Kublai spent more time among the Chinese right, that is also military true. than Menka had. He takes part in the great Western invasion into uh, Russia. Right. Uh, in year, is he actually going to Europe? I don't remember if he, if Menka himself is in Europe, but he's part of that invasion. While Kublai is handling uh, uh, China to administer in China and these sorts of stuff. So Menka. Like Kublai, I think had more of a appreciation for. He saw bureaucracy and all the like the levels of specifically Chinese bureaucracy as sort of a necessary tool. Whereas I think America, if he had time to do more uh, time setting up government in China, I I don't think he would have in the same way. He would have, yeah, not necessarily his own thing, but he would have cut out cut bits he liked, or used bits he liked, but had more of that Central Asian yeah. uh, influence, kind of seeing like, alright, I just... I, I And I really don't think he would have bothered with uh, all the lovely Chinese titles and the Book of Changes and all these yeah. customs and whatnot that Kublai did. I yeah. think Mink, uh, he's... From what I know of, and I don't know him quite as well as Chinggis. I don't know him either all that well. They're both dead. But, <laughs> like, I don't know, like, all the written stuff on him like I do Chinggis. But yeah. from what I gather, he's a bit more in the vein of Chinggis in that he had that l- less frills and uh, function over form, what I'm trying to say, was sort of his... Yeah, that makes sense. Is thing. Whereas Kublai had that appreciation for form to go along with uh, function. Yeah. Kublai actually had the opposite problem of Uncle Khan. Instead of dying too early, he probably died too late. And then things kind of yeah. corruption and rot got set in. But I can imagine. So. And. Oh, yeah. um, and. And all sort and the successions are also just coming in. The first, uh, the first generation of um, of Mongol Hans after Genghis is kind of they're all dying. Like Chagatai, I believe, like uh, gets um, uh, Chagatai gets his uh, gets his succession. Uh, Batu's already uh, mentioned, uh, as I already mentioned, is uh, ruling the Ulus Jochi as best he can. Well, even he he dies uh, twelve fifty five. Yeah. So yeah, he. Yeah. Even that, the second generation of Mongols after Qing, they're already dying off. Yeah, that is true. They sure are. There's well, a lot of another, people going. <laughs> well, that's another important element to this, though, is the farther on we go from the... The, far, the far, farther on we go in the 13th century, the more removed all the Mongols are from Chinggis, that period of really close, tight-knit unity... And the farther removed they are from Mongolia itself, right? Uh, so it's there's this the same sense that we're oh we're all it's the same family, but it's not necessarily the same community that it was. So that's when you get this increasing propensity to civil wars and backstabbing and assassination and stuff. Yeah, it's now it's a generation who never had that same complete overbearing presence, or demigod like presence of Chinggis Khan. Yeah, or in Ergodai, he had he was personally appointed by Chinggis Khan. Yeah, he might as well have been appointed by God, right? Yep, indeed. Oh, so. yeah, and 
the and Giovanni then after Monka comes in and all the, and, and all and all the usual and all the usual stuff in the Mongol Empire keeps on chugging. The, he documents that the Bulgars, the Us, and the Rus rebel, and then Monka and then and and then and then the whole Russian campaign happens, and Bul, and the Bulgars are just absolutely slaughtered, and the Rus are just. And, and the Rus are absolutely pummeled. The Kipchaks are wiped out the face of the earth, and then it's on on to the next target. Poland, you're getting attacked. Hungary, you're also getting a Mongol raid. <laughs> are we going oh, to be really? nice? To yeah, <laughs> we're not going to be nice to people today. <laughs> this is just what's happening today. And uh, they also send. Uh, well, and they also send, uh, I believe, one of their brothers, a uh, Sibakan, on uh, a short bit of reconnaissance with a, with a two men over in Hungary. And then shortly after that, the famous Battle of Mohi happens, where the Hungarians are just. They try to punch at the Mongols, but they realize they are completely out of their league. They just can't stand a chance. <laughs> Does, it doesn't go great, I think. You could, you could say. Oh, it does not. The Mongols absolutely slaughter everything, and then there's a little bit more on, I believe, Chagatai doing some stuff. Maybe just a little bit of jumping back and forth between the timeline. And uh, and then there's another city founded, Kutlug, I believe. The Just the usual, like, everything is, everything is kind of sort of fine in the Mongol Empire, like, the boundaries of the various uh, Uluses are kept, and and people are still saying yes to uh, Monka for as long as he's going to live, which isn't going to be too long. <laughs> and, and but there is one guy running around, I believe Hoosier, who's trying to influence, I believe, the Chagatides uh, a little bit too much, and Yasulun, uh, Chag one Chagatai's wives. Gets a heads up and just decides, oh, Hoosier? He's dead. <laughs> official bad, uh, official bad, but not the overall administration is bad, so just keep the Mongol Empire running. And that, this is where I believe uh, Kar Ugul officially succeeds Chagatai, um, and I. Uh, where or where at least he is first mentioned because he's been he's been running everything since Chagatai's been kind of dead for a while. And there's and the and the, and the, and then there's a little bit of mention of this other guy uh, uh Yesu and this is ah. So anyways, uh, Jack Meister had to go, and I'll just leave us right off here with uh, Kara Ugul uh, succeeds to the position of of being the Khan of the Chagatai, uh, Chagatai uh, Ulus, and there's a brief feud here with, I believe, uh, there's a brief feud here with uh, Yesu, and uh, uh, between Yesu and uh, Monka and Yesu is of course drunk off his ass, as are a lot of Mongols apparently. And and uh, and uh, apparently this is with uh, Guyuk still on in on the timeline, and he actually kind of likes Yesu and supports him. But either way, that uh, but either way that doesn't last for too long because. Uh, uh, because Kara Ugul uh, n very quickly uh, rips him apart and uh, n rips him apart and purges all his supporters, and it's just all very much done there. Anyways, I'm going to end off right about there. So as usual, uh, subscribe to my channel at uh, Sam J Morganser, and obviously don't forget to subscribe to Jack Meister's channel. I imagine most of my viewership comes from Jack Master anyway, so that shouldn't be too much of a stretch. And if you can, uh, support uh, either one of us on Patreon or perhaps even both of us. I also have a uh, support plan that you can set up right here on Anchor, the people that I'm recording with, or rather the company. Um, 
Also, check out my Twitter at YoungBards101. Uh, follow us on Tumblr, Facebook. All the links will just be in the description as usual. Uh, love you guys. Um, bye.